Hello and welcome to the My Ministry Mission podcast, where I'm taking you on a journey with me from unbeliever to disciple of Christ. As a Christian young in his faith, I'll share with you what I've learned as I seek a position of ministry in my life. I urge you to visit my website at myministrymission.com and to find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash myministrymission. My name is Jason, and this is my mission. Greetings, fellow Christ followers. I hope the last two weeks have been productive and filled with many blessings for you. In my last episode, I told you I wanted to fine-tune my podcast format, and this episode is an attempt to move that direction by addressing difficult topic for new Christians, which is what Bible to read. When I first became a Christian, figuring out which Bible to read weighed very heavily on me. I already had a King James Version, but I found it very difficult to understand. I mean, I could read the words, but synthesizing that information into something useful evaded me. However, I felt that if I deviated from the almighty King James Version, I was less committed to my faith journey. So I struggled with it for some time. I finally broke down and asked my pastor what version I should be reading, and he directed me to the NIV, or New International Version. I did as I was told, and got myself a nice NIV Bible, and it has made a world of difference. However, I really wish I would have had the information I'm about to share with you today back then, because it would have explained why the NIV version and others like it are easier to read and understand. So in today's episode, I'll take some time to discuss the different types of translations of the Bible. My hope is that you will begin to understand the spectrum of Bible translations and walk away equipped with more knowledge to really understand what you're reading every day. At least I hope you're reading your Bible every day. Before I get started, I would like to take a few minutes to share with you how my last two weeks have gone. I wish I could say it was all smooth sailing, but it really wasn't. I mentioned in a previous episode that my grandma passed away in January of this year, and we did a graveside service for the family two weeks later. In between the last episode and this one, we hosted a separate full church service, a celebration of life at my grandma's church. Bear with me. I promise I'm not trying to bum you out. There is a point to this. I was told last minute that I... I was on the program for the remembrance part of the service. Well, with only four days to prepare, I got to work jotting down some notes and thinking about the memories I wanted to share because I I really wanted to do my grandma proud. I, of course, also went to my Bible and started digging through different proverbs and psalms and other verses. Of course, Psalm 23 was already spoken for, uh, but I felt it was far too impersonal anyways. Then I stumbled upon Proverbs 13.22, which reads, A good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children, but a sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. I knew that God had directed me to this verse, so I started building what I was going to say around it, and this is what I wanted to share with you. This Proverbs teaches us that a good person passes an inheritance so that it's so abundant it flows down to their grandchildren and hopefully beyond. Now, we often think of an inheritance as an estate, money, maybe other material items, but that's not what Proverbs 13.22 is talking about. Now, we all know through Christ we gain our inheritance into the kingdom of heaven. That is clearly not a material object. But what about here on earth? Then it dawned on me what we leave behind for the next generation is something that cannot be spent or sold. It's the memories of our times shared with the people we love. It's the lessons of wisdom that are handed down to us from age. It's the moments that live on in our hearts that give us pause once in a while, that, that bring a smile to our face when we see, do, or smell something familiar. Now, this made me keenly aware of my own life and legacy, and it made me ask myself three questions in the context of Proverbs 13.22. What inheritance have I received? What inheritance am I passing down to my daughter or to the next generation? And is God a part of the inheritance I've received and that I'm passing along? Do yourself a favor and ask yourself those questions and see what answers you come up with. I understand that not everyone has a happy childhood and that not everyone is taught to love God growing up. But even in these gaps, God can create abundance for us that we can pass down as our inheritance. I hope this gives you something to ponder. All right, now it's time to move on to the main purpose of this podcast episode. Have you ever wondered why there are so many Bible translations to choose from? I mean, it's overwhelming and it's a valid question. If you consider other books that have been translated from one language to others, 
there's generally one version for each language, right? Even taking modern books and translating them can be a little bit challenging because the words aren't always able to be translated one for one. We also have to consider that we're not just translating a language, we're translating an idea formulated around a culture as well as the language. The author of any book is writing that book framed by his or her experience, cultural influence, as well as language and grammar. Now consider this, the Bible is a collection of 66 books written in multiple formats over four, by over 40 authors over a period of 1,500 years, 1,500 years. Now, each author wrote from his perspective, his culture, his native language, using his worldviews. Can you see why translating the Bible is such a challenge? When it comes to Bible translations, there can be grouped into one of three primary categories. Uh, the first is formal equivalence, which is also known as word-for-word -word or literal translation. The second is dynamic equivalent, which is considered thought-for-thought. -thought. And then the third is optimal equivalence, which is also known as paraphrase or free translation. Now, I'm going to go into more detail on these three in just a moment. But I also wanted to point out that there are different types of Bibles. These include the traditional Bible, which is just your normal Bible, text only with minimal footnotes, maybe a map or two. Then there's a study Bible. Now, these Bibles have extensive footnotes, explanatory notes near the text, and often have commentaries, narratives, and an abundance of maps to help you build more context around the scripture. Then you have a reference Bible. This is a Bible that usually has some sort of a cyclopedic index of sorts, like an encyclopedia with verse references, a concordance, which is kind of like a dictionary of common words, and generally some maps as well. There are one-year Bibles, which is a Bible that's divided into 365 readings, one for each day of the year, and usually has a portion of like the Old Testament, New Testament, maybe Proverbs and Psalms on each day. We also have chronological Bibles. Now, the Bible doesn't always follow a natural chronological flow. So these have the entire Bible story in one continuous chronological order with narration to cover the gaps. Uh, we have a pastor's Bible or a preacher's Bible, which include protocol outlines and recommended verses for special services or occasions like a hospital visit or weddings or even a funeral. Uh, we have children's Bibles, which, of course, this Bible is designed for children with simplified stories, maybe even color drawings and maps. And then there's also like a parallel Bible. Now, these have anywhere from two to upwards of eight translations side by side. Now, there are other types of Bibles. Now, hopefully this gives you an idea of what I'm talking about, though. I do recommend you get a couple of different Bibles, one that is just a traditional Bible as a daily reader, and then get yourself a good study Bible. Uh, there's also a bunch of online resources that I'll talk about towards the end of this podcast that should help you on your quest for finding the right Bible translations. Now, one more quick note. If you've done any research on Bible translations, you'll see like an alphabet soup of three to four letters, ESV, KJV, NIV, NASB, and so on. These represent the different versions. Now, for the purpose of this episode, I will try to call out each, each version by name and to give you its acronym, and hopefully that will help make things a little bit less confusing. Starting with the word-for-word -word translations. Now, in this type of translation, the translator takes each Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek word and basically converts it into English word or an English phrase. Now, this sounds easier than it is because English words are more restrictive. One of the biggest selling points of this type of translation is that it is literal, and the translators try to get as close to the original text as possible. Now, the downside of a word-for-word -word translation is that they are generally more difficult to read. They read at a higher level. And sometimes the phrases may be cumbersome and difficult to understand. Now, some examples of word-for-word -word translations is the English Standard Version, or ESV, the King James Version, or KJV, the New American Standard, NASB, and there's a 1995 and a 2020 version of this Bible translation. There's the New King James Version, NKJV, and then Young's Literal Translation, YLT. Now, there's obviously more, but those are a few of the ones that come up more frequently now let me compare these using one of my favorite verses, James 1.19. Starting with the English Standard Version, or ESV, it reads as follows. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Okay, that makes sense, right? Well, let's look at the King James Version, KJV, which reads, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Okay, it's a little different, but it's, it's still, you get the point. How about the New American Standard, the 1995 version, or NASB, NASB 1995? 
It reads as follows. This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Okay, NASB or the New American Standard 2020 version reads as follows. You know this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Now everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. All right, we're almost done. Hang in with me. How about the New King James Version or NKJV, which reads, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. All right, one more. The Young's Little Translation reads, So then, my brethren beloved, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Okay, they all, they all sound pretty much the same. So let me break this down just a little bit so we can see how these words are translated or this, this word-for-word translation works. In this verse, it starts out with the Greek word hoste, which translates into wherefore or know this or this you know or so then and so on. It's a single word, basically a particle of speech that is translated into a phrase that is somewhat similar across these translations. A little different here and there, but pretty much similar. The next word is mu, which all of these versions have translated into my, but it could also be I or me or of me, based on Strong's translations. Now, the next two words are agapetas and adelphas. Agapetas means beloved, which all of these versions somewhat agree on. Adelphas means brothers or brethren, which is similar across all these translations as well, but the order necessarily isn't consistent between these two words. You know, beloved brethren, beloved brothers, brethren beloved, And even in the NASB 2020 translation, they translate it into brothers and sisters instead of leaving it as a masculine noun. So as you can see, these translations are taking the original Greek word for word and translating it. They assemble those words into phrases in English and an English structure that for the most part makes sense. While there are a few differences, they are very similar. And that hopefully summarizes word for word well enough. Now that we've talked about that, we can move on to thought for thought, or what they call dynamic equivalent. Now, this translation focuses on taking the meaning from the original language and translating it into English that is easy to read without translating every single word literally. The translators are still striving to remain as close to the meaning of the original text as possible, and they do this by summarizing the overarching ideas. Now, the goal for this translation is to offer the reader an easy way to understand and grasp biblical concepts. Most of these translations read between like a fourth and seventh grade reading level, which makes them more comprehensible. Some of the most common thought-for-thought Bible translations include the Good News Translation, or GNT, the New Living Translation, or NLT, the New International Version, or NIV, the Contemporary English Version, or CEV, and the Common English Bible, or CEB. Now, for comparison reasons, let me use the same James 119 verse to illustrate how these Bibles read instead of the word for word. Starting with the Good News translation, or GNT, it reads as follows. Remember this, my dear friends. Everyone must be quick to listen, but slow to speak and slow to become angry. Moving on to the New Living Translation, or NLT. It reads as follows. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. The New International Version, or NIV, reads, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Uh, Contemporary English Version reads, or CEV, it reads as follows. My dear friends, you should be quick to listen and slow to speak or get angry. And then finally, the Common English Bible, or CEB, reads as follows. Know this, my dear brothers and sisters, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to grow angry. So if you'll notice, the structure of these flows a little bit better, but you still get the same message as the word-for-word, word, which is the major benefit of using a thought-for-thought translation. The concern with these translations is that it leaves room for the translators to insert more of their own bias into their translated work, and critics of this method feel it's too subjective. My personal opinion is that the readability of Thought for Thought is great for everyday reading Bible, because it helps me understand the word better, and it's close enough to word-for-word translations. That being said, if I decide to do more of an in-depth study of any part of the Bible, I will review a word-for-word translation like ESV. If I want to go even further, I'll use an interlinear Bible, and I'll talk about this later, 
Uh, then I'll go and read some of the commentaries. I like David Guzik, Matthew Henry, Jameson, Fawcett and Brown, and Chuck Smith, to name a few. The last type of translation I'll touch on is paraphrase. And in this translation, the scriptures are loosely translated for maximum readability, but it lacks the accuracy of a word-for-word or even a thought-for-thought -thought translation. They skip the finer nuances in the text, but rather focus on presenting the main point of each verse. Now, some of the most common paraphrase translations include the Message, MSG, the Living Bible, TLB, and the Phillips translation, also known as Phillips. Now, once again, I'm going to use James 119 to demonstrate how a paraphrase Bible reads, starting with the Message, which goes like this. Post this at all intersections, dear friends. Lead with your ears, follow up with your tongue, and let anger straggle along in the rear. Okay, that's, that's a little different, right? Okay, so moving on to the Living Bible, or TLB, it reads as follows. Dear brothers, don't ever forget that it is best to listen much, speak little, and not become angry. Okay, and the last one is the Phillips translation, or Phillips. In view of what he has made us then, dear brothers, let every man be quick to listen, but slow to use his tongue and slow to lose his temper. As you can see, the readability is much easier, and in certain circumstances, it provides a little extra information or context that is helpful to, to try to understand the scripture a little bit better. I find paraphrase versions as a great place to go to get a little extra insight in, in basic English, but... I don't find these translations very useful as a study Bible or even a daily reader for, for me. That's just my personal opinion. Now, I do use them, but once in a while. If you consider the criticism of thought-for-thought -thought Bibles, you can probably imagine how critics see a paraphrase Bible. So just be careful when you read these to understand exactly what they are. A loose translation that could potentially have a great deal of bias from the translator. One thing I'd like you to keep in mind is this. When I say that these translations fall into the category of word-for-word -word or thought-for-thought -thought or paraphrase, that doesn't mean that they are hard and fast within these categories. It means if you imagine there's a line going from left to right, on the left is word-for-word -word and on the right is paraphrase, and then thought-for-thought -thought is right in the middle. As you move from the left to the right on the spectrum, these translations become less literal and more subjective and each translation will fall somewhere within this spectrum. For example, the interlinear translation I mentioned before is actually a tool that is used by the reader uh, to get the original Hebrew or Greek alongside an English translation. Each word has more information, more context. This would be on the far left of the word-for-word -word column. Moving to the right towards thought-for-thought, -thought, you might see the New American Standard, or NASB, followed by the English Standard Version, ESV, and maybe the King James Version, KJV, and so on. The point I'm trying to make here is that each of these translations may creep towards one or the other categories in some degree or another. The New King James Version is still considered a word-for-word -word translation, but it sits closer to the edge of thought-for-thought -thought category than its predecessor, the King James Version. Hopefully that made sense to you. Now that we've gone over those three types of translations, let's talk about what online tools are available to help you figure out what works best for you. Now, the first resource I would recommend is the Uversion Bible app. You can find this resource on your iPhone or Android device in, in your store. You can also visit Bible.com for an online version. The Uversion Bible app offers tons of translation, even in different languages. You can highlight and make notes. You can choose from Bible plans and do special devotionals. You can engage your friends and family in those plans. Uh, you can do prayers. It's just an all-around great resource. But the best benefit is that you can switch between these translations and try them out. I also like Bible Hub, which is found at BibleHub.com. Uh, what I really like about this tool is that you can search for any verse and get that verse in multiple translations in one page. They also provide context, cross-reference, commentaries, even the original Greek or Hebrew. It's kind of a good one-stop shop for any Bible verse. And next up on my list is the Bible Project, found at BibleProject.com. Here you will find short videos that help explain different parts of the Bible, how to read the Bible. They even have a pretty extensive podcast that you can listen to. That doesn't mean you leave me. Just go listen to it and then come back. <laughs> Now, one of my favorite sites to visit is for in-depth research and understanding is the Blue Letter Bible at blueletterbible.com. If you notice, I make these URLs really easy to remember. Uh, the translations are fairly limited, but you can search for any verse or even an entire book 
And next to each verse in the list will be a tools button, which will give you interlinear, different Bible translations of that verse, cross-references, commentaries, dictionaries, and so much more. It's kind of like Bible Hub on steroids. And then one last tool I'll offer you is the Christian Classic Ethereal Library, or ccel.org. This is a bit clunky, but you can search for any verse or even a topic and get a ton of information from a variety of sources. It is a good tool for gathering information, doing more of a deep dive, but it does take a little getting used to, and just be wary of the information you're getting. Always double check. So I put a link to all of these tools in the show notes for this episode, so you can go back and explore them even more. So I guess the question still remains, what Bible version is best for you? The answer is simple, the one you can read and understand the best. I'm sorry I can't be more specific, but it's just it just requires you to do some exploration and experimenting. Try using the resources I've mentioned and start doing your own research and review. If you feel you need more guidance, I always recommend talking to your pastor. They have a lot of experience reading Bibles. I do recommend you have a daily reader and a good study Bible. Study Bibles are a bit pricey, uh, but they're worth the investment. Now, for my daily reader, I use the New International Version, or NIV, translation. It's a thought-for-thought translation, and I feel really connected to it. However, I also have an ESV, or English Standard Version, study Bible, which is a word-for-word translation, that expands on the content of what I'm reading. NIV, thought-for-thought, ESV, word-for-word. So I kind of use both there, but I drill down as I need to. As I mentioned, occasionally I'll go to a paraphrase Bible to get a little bit more content or context, and for that I use the Amplified Version, but I don't consider any paraphrase Bible to be authoritative, just my humble opinion. If I need more information from there, I'll hit Blue Letter Bible and start really digging into the commentaries, review interlinearies, and see the words, how they're translated. I would like to caution you against doing a blind Google search for biblical topics. You might be fed incorrect information, or someone's opinion masked as fact. My final note is this. I know there are some purists who believe that King James Version is the only version that should be used, and and that's fine for them. But it did me little good because I struggled to understand it. Use what works, what connects you to God, and always seek to understand God's Word. That's the show for today. Come back in two weeks and join me as I talk through dealing with a bad attitude. That should be interesting. I hope you have a wonderful two weeks, and God bless you. Thank you again for listening to this episode. If you have any questions or comments, I urge you to visit my website at myministrymission.com. You can click the contact button, or you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash myministrymission. Remember to pray and remember to love God and each other. My name is Jason, and this is my mission.